One year ago, we looked at some of the live service games that barely lived. Barely lived? Whatever. Instead of following their planned roadmaps of content and being perpetual platforms of entertainment, these games stopped updating, shut down servers, and in some cases, disappeared from storefronts entirely. But they weren't the only ones, and since then even more live service games have been led to the chopping block mere moments after launching in the first place. So let us please have a moment of silence for the following live service games that didn't live very long at all. Live? 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 I don't know anymore. Eventually, the tower became a symbol of unrelenting ambition. That tower's name is Babylon. Platinum Games are good at making unforgettable games, such as Bayonetta, Near Automata... Oh, what about Babylon's Fall? The hell is Babylon's Fall? Turns out, Babylon's Fall was an action RPG hack-and-slash title from Platinum Games, which should have meant it was, you know, good. But beta tests were rocky, with players complaining of bad blurry graphics, and when reviewers and players got their hands on the final product in March 2022, it very much wasn't good. It was the studio's first attempt at a live service game, and they didn't quite get the formula right. There was loot, and the numbers went up, but it wasn't satisfying. Worst of all, the combat wasn't even that special, being described by Ed Thorne in his review at Rock Paper Shotgun as largely Blair. Platinum Games combat? Blair? You gotta be yanking my astral chain! That's another one. It wasn't just the review scores that ended up being in the toilet. The initial player base was also embarrassingly tiny, as the day after launch it was reported that fewer than 1,000 people were playing it on Steam. The development team were keen to assure players that their plans for future seasons would not be put on hold and that player feedback was being taken on board. Square Enix even put out a survey asking what improvements players wanted. But not much improved, with reports of its concurrent player numbers dropping to not just single digits, but single players. Less than six months after launch, Square Enix announced that the servers would be shut down on the 28th of February 2023, putting the beleaguered title out of its misery within 12 months of launch. In a sad case of nominative determinism, Babylon's Fall fell harder than my rating on Uber when I tried to tell my last driver about the plot of Babylon's Fall. Okay, so the main quest that was playable at launch is the Liberator questline, where you play a sentinel who is tested to see if they're worthy of the Gideon Coffin, which Arya opens up to help you fight the Galu um, and stop the plague that's being caused by the Blue Sun, um, who's actually an alien deity called Nurgle. Wait, why, why are we stopping here? This isn't my house. The memory of everyone's aerodynamic elbow drops will not soon be forgotten. Now, if you'll excuse me, ABS is throwing me a farewell party at Squats downtown. All you can eat spicy boneless poppers. See you there. And uh, how about one more body slam for old time's sake? Ooh, that kind of hurts. <laughs> Swelling up already. Oh, that's going to leave a bruise. <laughs> well, on to Squats. One problem suffered by many of these live service failures is that they're chasing a trend. One such trend being the Battle Royale shooter. It's a massively crowded market, and you're not going to claw many Battle Royale shooter players away from games they've already invested all their free time into. So some games decide to go with a different angle. Such is the case with Rumbleverse, whose different take on the Battle Royale was punching people really hard. Published by Epic Games, owners of Fortnite, Rumbleverse was a wrestling-themed battle royale that, unlike a Fortnite round ending with a sniper shot, forced players to get up close and personal if they wanted to win. It had a huge roster of characters, a fun Fortnite-inspired art style, and it was made by developers Iron Galaxy, who had previously worked on two seasons worth of content for Xbox's popular fighting game Killer Instinct. Problem was, it didn't stick the landing, which any wrestler will know is vitally important, especially if you're landing on your back on top of another person in spandex. Unlike a wrestler's walk-on, when Rumbleverse released on the 11th of August 2022, it was to very little buzz, very little fanfare, and a shameful lack of pyrotechnics. So few media outlets reviewed it that it never even reached the four review minimum needed for a Metascore on Metacritic. Some blamed Epic for not pushing the game enough, some felt it didn't look different enough to Fortnite for people to take notice, and others noted that the fighting mechanics made the game less accessible to new players compared to shooters where you can just, well, you know, point and shoot. 
Despite efforts to save the game, on the 31st of January 2023, Iron Galaxy announced in a blog post on Rumbleverse.com that the servers would be going offline just one month later, on the 28th of February. In an open letter that Iron Galaxy published the same day, the developer wrote, It is our sincerest hope that this news does not mark the end of Rumbleverse. You may not yet have seen the Rumble in its final form. At the time of filming, the game is still unavailable, but since Iron Galaxy owns Rumbleverse, there's always a chance that another publisher could pick up the mantle and power bomb it to snatch the win. Can you smell the rocks cooking? Am I doing this right? When a sequel in a multiplayer series comes out, players typically jump over to the new game, leaving the old game's servers an absolute ghost town. For example, the Call of Duty franchise has had annual releases since 2005, each with an attached multiplayer mode, and every time a new game has dropped, the player base for the previous game has also dropped, as millions of players clambered over into the new title. But in March 2020, Activision Blizzard released the free-to-play live service title Call of Duty Warzone. Their gritty take on the Battle Royale trend proved to be pretty popular, with over 6 million people downloading it in the first 24 hours. And even though it was free, it still made them a buttload of money, contributing to the $1.3 billion Activision Blizzard made off of microtransactions in the final financial quarter of 2020. Dang, that's a lot of Billy the Puppet skins! Now, one of the actually good concepts behind live service games is that instead of replacing a whole game, updates can be added over time, such as new maps, new weapons, new modes, etc. Meaning that good multiplayer titles can last for far longer because the player base isn't constantly being shifted to a new game. However, Activision Blizzard looked at this model and went, nah. Instead of upgrading the game they already had, just two years later, a sequel, Call of Duty Warzone 2.0, appeared. So the devs could focus on Warzone 2's launch, Call of Duty Warzone 1.0 went offline for two weeks before being revived in a new, stripped-back form, Warzone Caldera. So the game disappeared in its original form, becoming a shadow of its former self, with fewer game modes. Complete. But then, just seven months later, Call of Duty staff announced in a blog post that Warzone Caldera was shutting down entirely on the 21st of September 2023, and that all Caldera gameplay, player progression, inventories and online services will expire on that date. This unsurprisingly pissed off a lot of players, as many still preferred the gameplay of Warzone 1 and its maps, both Caldera and especially the fan-beloved Verdansk original. Players even pointed out that older multiplayer COD titles still had working servers for those that wanted to play. Heck, one month after the Warzone shutdown announcement, servers for Xbox 360 titles were resurrected, perhaps just in an effort to piss Warzone fans off even more. Not only would people be losing access to a fun game, but they couldn't carry over the skins and items that they'd invested time and money into. Still, if it reduces the number of times I'm sniped by Billy the Puppet, I'm all for it. Ah! No! Stop it. Some of you may remember how Hero Shooter Battleborn was announced in July 2014, only for Blizzard to announce Overwatch shortly after. The fact that you can buy Tracer figurines in Walmart should tell you everything you need to know about who came out on top there. So when yet another Hero Shooter was announced in 2015, this time Lawbreakers from Boss Key Productions, headed up by the ex-lead designer on the Gears of War series Cliff Blazinski, many eyebrows were raised. Bye -bye. Did the world need another Hero Shooter? In this suddenly crowded field, was late to the party lawbreakers going to defy expectations? <gasps> no. It's not like they didn't try. The team at Bosky had a plan to distinguish their game from other hero shooters. In a blog post, they claimed lawbreakers had evolved into an R-rated experience. We are putting the cartoon characters to bed. The adults are here to cause violence and chaos. We don't want to make a game that will be lumped in with the cartoon style from our competitors. Lawbreakers is a blood sport. Considering what happened next, it was more like a bloodbath. 
When it finally emerged on the 8th of August 2017, Lawbreakers, with its gravity-defying gameplay elements, was decent and didn't review too badly. But it wasn't enough. The number of concurrent players peaked during a closed beta in June of that year at around 7,500 players, was down in the hundreds by the end of its first month, and later that year collapsed to 10. 10 players total. Not even enough for one football team. They pushed on, adding new content for the handful of people still playing, but it wouldn't last. The team finally released a statement in April 2018 saying that Lawbreakers failed to find enough of an audience to generate the funds necessary to keep it sustained in the manner we had originally planned for and anticipated. The game quietly went free to play in June and in September 2018, just over a year after launch, Lawbreakers servers were shut down for good. And that's why if you go to Walmart today, you won't find any figurines of Battle Medic Feng. What? No Feng heads? It's a Battle Medic! from Giannis Toys. Radical Heights action figures. Get your kids familiar with America's favorite game show. Perhaps you're wondering what Lawbreakers developers Boss Key Productions did next. Oh look, here's the fifth entry in this list video. Instead of trying something entirely new and unique, this developer decided to clamber onto the Battle Royale bandwagon. While Lawbreakers was still crumbling like a foe blasted by Battle Medic Feng's Firefly pistol, another game was in the works, Radical Heights. <laughs> thank you, Roddy, and thank you everyone in our studio audience for being here today. The team hoped to draw Battle Royale aficionados away from Fortnite by using a similarly cartoony and certainly not Bloodsport themed aesthetic, with an 80s game show twist. But the game looked less like a fun game show studio set and more like a basic suburban sandbox with some sparkly casino machines chucked in. Because it was! On account of how Radical Heights was actually released in extreme early access, with an X, which was a fun marketing term for broken as f Early access, of course, was originally a useful way for indie developers to release mostly finished games to get funds and feedback to improve before release. But Radical Heights was just five months into development when it was unleashed on unsuspecting players, half empty and barely working. It looked less like a game and more like someone bought a bunch of Unity store assets and vomited them onto a map. Even the character creator only had male listed as default and female as coming soon. Going by how early these guys released everything else, I doubt it. The game was buggy as hell, and to quote Fraser Brown's review at Rock Paper Shotgun, if Radical Heights was any more early access, we might as well be trying to play a design document. Man, they do not hold back at RPS! The game was so broken that no one wanted to stick around, and players that did found it difficult to get into games with more than a handful of people. This rush to market but late to the trend game didn't manage to save Boss Key Productions, with the studio shutting down entirely just one month after the game's release. While Radical Heights remained playable for a while, it too quietly disappeared a few months later. Disappeared like Battle Medic Feng's support drones after 6.25 seconds. We've designed survival in this world to be a thrilling experience. The weapons, which can be modified, are made with maximum realism to ensure that combat remains deep and engaging at all times. Each weapon boasts unique characteristics, as well as realistic reload and recoil mechanics. If you've never heard of The Day Before, it was an online zombie survival horror about surviving in a ruined city. Sounds cool. Let me just open its Wikipedia page to learn more about it. Oh. Oh no. The Day Before was unveiled in early 2021 with a super impressive gameplay trailer that promised pie-in-the-sky miracles like these gorgeous visuals, or fantastically dynamic combat, or a massively multiplayer online world, or polite small talk over in-game voice chat. Alright, alright, alright. I have found a great cowboy hat. Tell her everything's alright. And there aren't any more guns in the valley. Easy, cowboy. Sadly, as the game was delayed time and time again, it became increasingly clear none of these things would be materialising. And especially not the polite small talk, as discourse around the day before became very bitter, with accusations that the game was a scam, copied work from other developers and relied on unpaid labour. In the end, it turned out the day before was real, but unfortunately being extant was about the only thing it had going for it. Players and critics responded with extreme negativity to the game upon its eventual early access release on the 7th of December 2023, criticising what was once Steam's most wishlisted game as empty, boring and very unsatisfying to play. 
The Day Before is easily one of the worst games I have ever played. A mere four days later, developer Fantastic announced it was closing, pulled the game from Steam and its servers shut down permanently in January 2024, ending The Day Before's live service undead slaughtering ambitions with staggering speed. So now it's not even extant. Unbelievable. In most cases, games actually get released before they announce they're shutting down. Then there's Love Life School Idol Festival 2 Miracle Live, a loose assemblage of words that, believe it or not, represent a video game. In January 2024, this Japanese pop idol themed rhythm action adventure game blew minds, not with its gameplay, but with an online announcement. In a post on the health site formerly known as Twitter, the Love Live School Idol Festival official account wrote, We are excited to break the news to you that the global version of Love Live School Idol Festival 2 Miracle Live is launching soon in February 2024. However, we also want to inform you that the global version will close its doors on May 31st, 2024, and cease in-app purchases accordingly. I'm sorry, but what the f***? In what is surely a games industry first, the closure of a game was announced at the same time as its release. <laughs> to be fair, the original Japanese version of the Love Live School Idol Festival 2 Miracle Live had already been out since the 15th of April 2023. However, the imminent closure of this Japanese version in March 2024 was also announced on the same day. So bad times for everyone around the world who loves this kind of thing. The way this came about was, the global version of the game was hugely delayed. So with the Japanese game and its financial ecosystem closing so soon, most likely so the creators K-Lab Games could work on more profitable ventures, the global release and closure was announced simultaneously so that people knew anything they bought in the game would be useless within 12 weeks. Still at the point of recording, the game is available to buy. And the shop is open after you download a 6.5 gigabyte patch. Right, this is fine, I can do this, I just need to free up quite a lot of space on my phone. Uh, all right, let me get rid of some of these apps. Calendar, that can go. Luke. Email, delete all. Luke. It's fine. It's Luke, fine. it's gonna be worthless. Yeah, that's... In, in just like three months or whatever, it's nothing. Stop it! Stop it, Luke! Luke? Luke? They're all gone, the download has begun. <sighs> um, I'm supposed to do an outro, but all I can think about is this download. Um, wow, it's going so slow. Videos here, Patreon as well, uh, Discord if click sign up. Hang on, I'm going to try and get on the Wi-Fi. <laughs>